Don't worry, I got you covered. IAMX will start with a quick project. IAMX is the world's first Web3 solution to provide the most secure self-sovereign identity, utilize and manage pre-authenticated data, maximize interoperability through a true interchain solution with 43 ledgers. Reward identity holders with revenue generating opportunities. For example, businesses that rely upon authenticated users or consumers are partnering with IAMX to sell subscriptions to their services through the IAMX terminals and platform. Because of this affiliate model, IAMX becomes a marketplace, connecting services to consumers, offering discounts to consumers for subscribing through the IAMX platform. IAMX is already partnering with several large telecom companies to sell telecom subscriptions through IAMX. The founders of IAMX has more than 20 years of experience in the mobile telecommunication industry. Okay. I hope that gave you a bit of context about IMX. Tim, do you have anything else to add? Um, yes, maybe the key takeaway should be that with our technology, you are connected to the internet like you are logged in. So this should be the key takeaway. Can you expand a little bit on that? Yes, um, if, if we look back, at the years of founding of the internet, we have to understand that the internet has not been built with a layer of identity and authentication. So this is why we always have those conversion breaks. This is why we need to fill in forms so often. This is why we need to prove our identity so often via video ident or post ident. And our technology cuts out those two steps. So form filling is done in one second. And also the verification of your identity. And this is based on the so-called self-sovereign identity and decentralized identifiers. And we are doing this in a marketplace model. And this is also why we have the connection to Marco Sabadello I don't know whether he already joined our space, um, but he is responsible for this area of decentralized identifiers. Thank you, Tim. Riz, if you see somebody named Marcus in the space, please send him a speaker's invite and then uh, we can continue the space with Tim for in the time uh, before he joins. Tim, so it sounds like IMX is solving a few problems at the same time, right? Uh, you talked about the easiness, one click to fill in the forms. I also read on your website, you have uh, the solution to online fraud. You can also improve the conversion rates for the merchants. So can you quickly walk us through those few problems that IMX product will solve? Yes. Um, so if you understand our marketplace approach and our technology, you always have to look through the various glasses. So um, for you, um, as a customer or for us, um, the biggest benefit is that we own our identity and um, we fully control this in a so-called um, identity wallet. We are providing one. This is the IMX identity wallet, but it works in any other wallet. And the product is 100% free for the user. Um, the benefit there for us, for the user, is that you can purchase everything with one click. The benefit for the verifier, and this was your question, um, is um, that you increase your conversion rate from about 2% to 5%. Um, this means that you reduce the marketing costs per sale by a factor of 4.16 because there is no form filling and the know your customer process is done in one click 
So this has a strong impact on the on the sales funnel and um, on the profitability there. And the value is about 95 euro per transaction. And the second one is the savings on the know your customer process. Um, in the physical world, if you look at European banks, um, the costs are about 10 euros or 10 US dollars per transaction. So this is also included in our solution. So it's a big benefit for the verifier. And when you say verifier, uh, can you give us some examples of those entities? Yes. Um, basically, we are talking about the 100 biggest e-commerce companies regarding revenues per country, because all of them, they have a transaction-based model where the customer needs to fill in a form. And when we are looking at banking products, at um, continuing obligations, there's usually you know, your customer process needed. And this is all done in one click via our app. So this is how we connect via our marketplace, the buyer and the seller. So IMX is not only an underlying infrastructure to collect those biometrics and different data, you're also a marketplace. How does that work? Um, we believe that um, in order to become a de facto standard for self-sovereign identity, customer-owned, customer-controlled, portable, um, interoperable, open, user-centric, secure, multilingual. We have to do it on various ledgers, but we also have to ensure that we become a de facto standard by usage. And to ensure usage, we have to connect buyers and sellers. Um, this is the main key to enable mass market adoption because technology is the one thing, but you know, usage is the thing that really counts. Yeah, I understand. And how does this marketplace work? Are you connecting merchants with the buyers, the customers, and you're giving some kind of revenue back to the holders of, of the digital identity? Is that correct? Um, we, as the purchasers, the buyers, have the benefit because the verifier safe costs is that all the products that we buy, they are cheaper than a regular online item. So we save about maybe 5% per transaction. This is our benefit um, that we have because we... Um, because the conversion rate is so much higher. This is the benefit that we have um, regarding um, the users. Um, if we look at um, the verifiers, they're, they're connected to us via transaction-based affiliate models. So it's a transaction-based model where we broker clients from A to B. And our platform provides the technical connection for this transaction and in the middle we have a tracking link so that we can generate revenues to the benefit of the user. So what's the difference between the verifier and the merchant? I'm assuming verifiers are the telcos like Vodafone and the merchants are just, you know, like Nike or hotels. Is that correct? Um, it is a transaction where, for example, you buy shoes. And um, if you buy shoes, you just need to fill in a certain form, provide the payment, and then the shoes are shipped to your house. Usually, right now, you would have to, to do this um, from a website where you're not registered with filling in a form only. And this takes about five minutes. So with our technology, it's only one second because the form filling is already done. If you look at other products um, that need a verification, for example, if you order a banking product, if you open an account um, at a certain exchange, 
if you do a mobile phone contract, then you need to do a know your customer process. It usually takes about eight minutes. And also with our technology there, you have this as a reusable know your customer process. So therefore, it's it's much much easier um, for the customer and for the verifier. Okay. Can you expand a little bit on the revenue sharing part? Yes. Um, our source of customer mass onboarding are telecommunication companies because they have pre-authenticated data in an identity, in a state-controlled identity market where they have checked the identity of new customers on a very high level. So it's either a post-ident where you need to go to the post office or you have a video ident with real persons behind it. So the quality of this Know Your Customer process is, is very high. And uh, we make this pre-authenticated data in the hands of the owner reusable. And this means that you can use this on further transaction without that you have the, the demand to redo it all the time. And it can be requested by by any partner, what is regular in an um, e-commerce business, but it is always controlled via the IMX identity wallet via you. So only if you want to provide this data, then the transaction is completed. Was this understandable? It's understandable so far as it's sort of like one-time KYC process, right? Once you're down, you don't need to do it for different merchant websites. But how do you how do you do this revenue sharing with the identity holders? Where is the revenue coming from? Um, one of the biggest revenue streams um, in the internet, in the Web 2.0 world, are the so-called affiliate revenues. This is if company A brokers new clients to company B, you get a revenue share based on the successful transactions. So either when you do a purchase, when you become a member, when you buy something, or when you have a subscription for something. And this is always compensated in those so-called affiliate revenues. And um, via this model, right now we are connected to, to about 120 different partners where if the customer buys something there, um, our partner, we and you, the customer, receive a benefit based on this transaction. So we put the revenue stream into three different baskets and everybody has a benefit. That makes a lot of sense. Really fascinating. Thank you. I do have a few more questions in other regards, but I think the listeners would want to ask them. So I'm going to save them for later. For now, I really want to know more about your tokenomics. It's one of the most interesting and complex tokenomics models I've ever seen. So I spent some time reading about it. Quite a few concepts. Darwinian quantity equation and Fibonacci sequence. I think it's really fascinating that you guys are using more complex models uh, in order to achieve the equilibrium. So, Tim, could you tell us, first of all, what's the reasoning behind your current tokenomics model and what does it look like? Yes, um, we are really a utility token. This means our function is to create or to verify identity. And for this, you need one IMX token. And um, let's say if we would found this business together and that we would need to decide right now, um, what is the token issuance plan regarding at what time do we mint how many token for what reasons? And all the other models that are out there right now, um, they have usually a certain amount of token per quarter. But we need to connect the issuance of the IMX token to its intended purpose. 
meaning the usage. This means to create or to verify identity. And therefore we have put this into a certain logic, how the token may develop. And this is derived from nature. This is how usually populations grow in biology and the mathematician Fibonacci, he has described this population growth in the so-called Fibonacci sequence. And this is what we use in order to do a decentral DNA development plan regarding the issuance of the IMX token. So it is not in our hands, it is happening by usage and this is the DNA of our token. So therefore it's decoupled with management decision and it's completely controlled by the market. That's very interesting. So when you say completely out of management's hands and in the hands of the market, does it mean that you don't really control the generation of it? It's like when people use it, you generate a token or is that how it works? Um, there's a simple metric. Um, we have a certain amount reserved for our um, private funding round and for, for our ISPO, for our pool. But um, more than 80% are based on the principle one new customer equals one IMX token. So also if we onboard customers via telecommunication partners, let's say 10 million per country, then those IMX tokens are directly delivered into the wallet of each customer. So this is when an IMX token is generated and uh, distributed. So this is what I meant that it's directly connected to usage. And this is why it's such a protected model. So we cannot float it. It is based to grow only when it does what it was designed to be doing. Awesome. Tim, thank you for your clear and concise explanation. I really appreciate it. It's really nice, actually. Uh, we're going to go to some questions from the audience now. So we've got Hosky up first, and then I think Liprog had then hand up as well. I hope I've pronounced that right. Uh, so if that's the case, then you can go second. If hey, anyone so else, by the way, wants to come up, just request speaker. If you've got a question, put your hands up. Sorry to cut you off, Hosky. Off you go, mate. All good. So I had a question regarding the tokenomics because, again, uh, pixelated dog with a McDonald's hat, so I need a little more uh, explanation. So from what I'm seeing uh, from your website, when I looked at the tokenomics, uh, it, it seems like... So I have a token that I purchased. I can then use this token to verify my identity and then after it's been used to verify my identity, I still control this token. Uh, now, if I have, uh, say, uh, two tokens, does that mean that I just exponentially grow my tokens? So if I have one, then I will end up with two, eventually end up with four. Is that what I'm getting? Because that's kind of what I'm getting from your website. I just wanted to confirm. Yes, we have also used this Fibonacci sequence next to the biological way to ensure um, a perfect pricing point uh, for our product is that we have built in a so-called cap capitalistic reward. This means that you have understood this 100% right. This means you as a first purchaser have the lifetime benefit that whenever the tokens are used for its intended purpose, you get a cert certain amount of token back. And the amount is based on this Fibonacci sequence that I just described. So the key ratio is out of one token, the maximum that can develop out of this is 12. And it is the sequence, and this is based on the Fibonacci sequence, one, one, two, three, five. Okay. So regarding that, okay, so the person at the top, when you get started, you get one token, then the further below you go, now you got two tokens, then you got three tokens further below, then you got five. 
um, if we put that out, like, okay, so it sounds like, what's the P word we don't use? Um, Ponzi-nomics? Like, I mean, don't get me wrong, because I'm trying to understand the tokenomics, because you said one to two to three to five. Do you get where I'm coming from? I'm just wanting to make sure I'm understanding this correctly. We have used the Fibonacci sequence that describes the growth of populations in this capitalistic way. And if we do this one-on-one, -on -one, this means that the token grows into a certain order up to a total amount of 12. And this is one, so there is... one, two, three, five. Okay, so it does not go okay. beyond 12. 12 would be the cap, correct? Yes, and token generations one to four are burned, and five lives forever. Okay, so the previous generations are then burned. Perfect. That's what I did not understand. Uh -huh. Yes, if we would also burn, let's say, if you would ask the question, why do you not also burn the last generation? Our identity system is a token-based identity system. This means we need a certain amount of fluctuating token in the market in order to be able to deliver our service, because this is always based on one IMX token. And therefore, this last generation lives forever to ensure the, um, the possibility that we can deliver the IMX service, our identity solution. So ultimately, one token, when you look at the last generation, so you're the person that got the first token, um, is always going to end uh, up or result in a total of five tokens at the end, correct? At the end, you have 12. You had, um, in a successful end, you have sold the IMX token 12 times, but bought it only one time. Okay, perfect. Hey there. <clears throat> so um, I go by IE Prague, La Prague, whatever's fine. So I think the announcer got me right. Um, my question actually had two of them, but uh, let's start with the first one. Regarding the transaction, will users be able to adjust details ad hoc, like say change shipping details? Uh, I assume they'll be able to just choose a different ADA wallet. Um, could you tell me more about the transaction piece? Yes, um, it is completely in the hands of you regarding the owner and uh, transaction fees apply if they should apply in a certain cryptocurrency. So we have no stake in this. This is neutral. This is neutral for us regarding the payment because we are not a substitute for payment. We are just identity. And if you choose a cryptocurrency that includes a certain amount of transaction gas fees, then you pay them. Uh, without touching us, so we have no uh, stakes in this. Regarding the storage of the decentralized um, identity, we support any ledger, but the storage costs need to be covered by the person who decides to store his credentials either on Cardano, on Ethereum, on Bitcoin, on whatever. So this is where we have no stake in, but we support any ledger with this. Our token is based on Cardano because we like this green crypto approach. But it works in any software environment, in any ledger, in any app, on any website. So it's completely technology neutral and simple. Thanks for that. And I guess I was coming from the angle of like buying something off of Amazon using the identity identity verification. I didn't know if shipping details would be contained or if this would just be a way to connect your wallet. I'm trying to understand an actual like purchase off the internet and how they get that product or yes. know which address to send. And can you change that specific shipping address? Yes, it is based on an attribute model. So for example, my name is Tim Heidfeld, Mr. Tim Heidfeld. Wildenbruchstraße. This is, for example, a street. And all of those four things that I just mentioned, they are so-called attributes. So this model is based on a pretty long attribute list. And via a certain mapping, you connect this to the various business cases. This means also, if you have an alternative shipping address, this is something that you decide and 
decide and steer in the part of your IMX identity wallet, what we call CPay for convenience payment. There you can put in whatever you want. There is no support regarding the te technology using this from our sites, but it works with any website to fill in any data you decide as a customer. That's fantastic. Okay, thanks for that. And then I had one other question. Hopefully this is a quick one. What kind of benefits do you see extending to customers and how do you see those being decided? Is that through some sort of governance or DAO model or through the partners themselves? How does that come about? Your question was how we drive market adoption, how we make it possible that the customer really use it, it uh, uses this. This was the question, right? Uh, you were mentioning that there were benefits that were coming back through the revenue sharing model to consumers. Yes. In that, who is deciding what those benefits are and what kind of benefits do you envision for the consumer side? Yes, um, the benefits are 100% decided by the verifier regarding you know, the merchant, the person who sells this, for example, Nike shoes, but they have a strong motivation to give benefits to person using IMX identity because this enables for them one-click fulfillment, increasing their conversion rate. This also means increasing market share in comparison to competitors and still being more profitable. So this is something that is solved by the market mechanism. We do not involve this. We do not involve into this because this is a mechanism that works on a marketplace. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Basically, the vendors decide what kind of benefits to extend to their consumers, and the marketplace ultimately decides which model works the best. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, I'm done with my time. Thank you, LeBlanc, and thanks, Tim, again. Uh, just before we move on to Adegar, I've got a quick question in the DM. So they say, how many tokens are there in total? How many are to be burned? And what percentage are investors buying? Yes, um, I need 30 seconds to find the correct amounts. No problem, it's okay. Also, while you're just doing that, Tim, if anyone else wants to come up and ask questions, feel free to request speaker. Uh, make sure if you've got a question, if you're a speaker and you have a question, pop your hand up to get you in the queue. We've got Ada Girl next and then Ada Fan. Um, if you're not, if you're up and you're not asking questions and more people are trying to come up, we will rotate you out. All right. So if you want to ask your question, just make sure you pop your hand up and then we'll move back to Tim when he's ready. Okay. Right now we have minted 60 million IMX token. And if you look at, um, our token, our tokenomics from the helicopter perspective, they are the biggest chair, 80% what is usage has a total amount of 2.2 million. This only happens under the metric, under the condition, one new customer equals one new IMX token. So this is 80% of the cake. 14% of the cake is for the group of the purchasers. Um, this is for the private sale of IMX. Then we have 3% in team, 2% in marketing, 1% in community in our IMX pool. If you invest there, you receive a certain amount of IMX token based on your delegated ADA. And we have a small percentage reserved for innovation purposes, but only if it contributes to the development of further business areas and revenue streams. Uh Tim, could I ask a quick follow-up? Uh, if Ada Grow, you're okay with that. I'm cutting the line uh, in front of you. Sorry about that. Quick follow-up. You said one customer equals to one IMX token because you're building the ecosystem using the Fibonacci sequence. So what does that mean in realistic terms? What if you have customers leaving the ecosystem? Or what if you get more than 2 billion customers? 
what happens to the total supply of the tokens? The total supply of the token develops only based on the metrics whether the token does its intended purpose or not. And this is to create or to verify identity. So if the system breathes, if we have new customers coming in and some are going, this is all balanced out by this sequence. Therefore, this is based only on those simple measurement metrics. So this is completely in the development of the market. So is it accurate mm -hmm. to say that if you w buy one token, you can sell it subsequently for several times and still get a revenue for all of the sales? Yes, the probability for this is very high because the product is designed that it's 100% free for the user you and me, and um, the costs for the verifier are right now very low. And therefore, we expect a high demand regarding the development of um, the price of this IMX token. OK, thank you very much. Ada Girl. Hey, uh, so my question is, I mean, I really like to hear about this project. I think we do need a lot of identity in you know, the crypto space. But my question is regarding the validators or the Web3 merchants. Um, I feel like uh, how much buy-in have you had from the merchants? Or is that even necessary with your technology? Um, you, you cited you know companies like Nike, but can you talk about the buy-in for the merchants um, regarding um, your token? Yes, you're talking about how does this market adoption work? How does it work that our technology is really used by e-commerce websites in Web 2.0 today? This is your question, right? That is correct, because I know that the majority of merchants are still in the Web 2, kind of waiting for Web 3 adoption. So where, um, what is your take on that? Yes, um, we have been founded, just that you understand our background, in November 2021 in Switzerland, in the canton of Zug. And in the same month, we have delivered a proof of work of our technology uh, regarding that we have proven that a German mobile telecommunication partner has onboarded one customer in one click fulfillment regarding end to end delivery of the SIM card to his house, including the transmitting of the full data package and also the successful know your customer um, process. And we have integrated this into a standard e-commerce software called Shopware, but it's a standard for um, many other e-commerce website so that this is also reusable as a plug-in for any partners. Um, right now, regarding the affiliate segment, we have onboarded almost 120 partners with this technology that is based on form filling where we do not need to ask this partner because the data, um, the partner receives the data based on the form filling and we receive the revenue for the transaction based on our so-called affiliate tracking links. So there we do not need to ask the partner. It is a technology that works just by using. So it's very simple. We do not need to ask because we follow the standard routines, procedures, data protections. Excellent. Because, thank you so much. Yeah, I okay, appreciate so that. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. That's that's kind of what I suspected. I just wanted to confirm. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Ada Girl. And uh, now we're going to move over to Ada Fan. Hi. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I have a question about uh, basically how this sits in certain regulatory frameworks. And uh, apologize because I got here late, but I'm. 
I'm thinking about when you actually do uh, cross-border shipments, then the, uh, the requirements for revealing identity, the so-called identity resolution, uh, are, are, are pretty specific. And it's, I think it's very hard to do sort of like a, a one-time KYC and then have that apply to multiple, to multiple, uh, to multiple vendors because it, it, it tends to be like an entity resolution per shipment. And, and then I guess that, that, that question, uh, that question kind of goes also down to sort of the non international shipment scenarios where KYC, uh, regulations may require, uh, that every organization has to main cert maintain certain documents and maintain that they have uh, a record that they have done the KYC uh, themselves. So, yeah, that's my question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for those very good questions. So, uh, number one, what I understood, I would like to start to comment on the topic of the data protection. Um, especially GDPR. If you compare the technology that we are using and that we have developed to all other technologies out there, then the key differentiator is that our so-called verifiable credential set containers are fully compliant with GDPR and also with anti-money laundering laws. And um, we have filed intellectual property for this form of proof. It's a zero knowledge proof method, but we have solved it by design. And um, so this is, I think, the key differentiator uh, number one, because if you do not solve this, our technology would not be usable in Europe, in North America, in Canada, in Asia. So this is why I underline this so strongly. And I think it was a very good question, part one. Part two, regarding the know your customer level, the person who decides whether this is acceptable or not is always the verifier. So let's say when we would have the bullish dumpling loan bank that sells loans online, meaning a banking license in a state governed market, then the bank needs to decide needs to decide whether the know your customer process that has been done by a telecommunication partner on a certain level, whether this is acceptable for this bank or not. And if you compare just the method, then from a pure controlling and scientific approach, it is the same level that the banks are using. So, um, but the decision, and this is what is important, always needs to be taken by the verifier. So we have no stakes in this. So this is something that has always been, uh, that, that is always decided by the verifier. So um, I'm, I'm not familiar, I'm, I'm only familiar with some scenarios, but if the bank was actually involved in, you know, international trade transaction and this is by the way not only just the large transactions but even the, you know amazon worries about this then you have to uh you have to obey international laws and if the bank is doing something like for instance issuing letters of credit then they have to do full entity resolutions and that's not just uh, verifying the customer, but verifying the warehouse, the shipment, shipment, and the, this is done per. This is, I think, not like something that you can keep a record of a customer. This is something uh, where you have to do this each time you issue a letter of credit. So I'm w just wondering if this like a verifiable presentation where you decide how much data you reveal would fit into a 
entity resolution a, a framework where entity resolution is required which is uh, really requiring maximal amount of data yes and we are not trying to be a substitute for this part the technology piece that we are offering is simple you have to think of this maybe like a minecraft building block just a simple block and it can do very simple things. And either it could work in your described business case or it, or it could not. What I know and what we know that it works in basically all Web 2.0 purchase e-commerce based business cases and in more. Maybe it doesn't work in your business case, but it's just, you know, just a simple building block and it can be used in many different cases. Maybe not in all, right? But our mm -hmm. goal was never to to substitute everything. It is just a simple building block that can be used in any ecosystem. And if your audit and verification level in your described example should be higher, then it maybe does not work there. Who knows? Okay. So can you give it uh, just so, uh, like your sample customer or sample user who 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 for which this level of i guess self sovereign identity meets their security level uh and and i guess there there must be a regulatory framework behind that that dictates how much uh dictates uh this you know what will actually uh, be considered to be a sufficient background check in order to pass a KYC so what is your typical customer use case for KYC? The typical use case, if you look at the source, so where is the data coming from? Number one, telecommunication partners with their pre-authenticated data. Number two, based on IMX identity video ident, we also give customers the chance to do a video ident onboarding and number three we have a so-called hardware software terminal to onboard customers so those are three different forms how we onboard the customers regarding privacy and uh, data protection um, the data that is stored is always in a state that it cannot be tempered so even if you would show me your identity wallet and open it to me, we could both not look into those verifiable credential container sets. So it's very, very secure. Mm. Okay, great. Um, I guess the last, just last follow up. So usually the, the KYC, it, it's not only like receiving the data, but then calling a third party provide uh, entity resolution provider to to verify the user and to check that they're not on a list of of uh, bad actors so this is almost always calling a third party uh, entity resolution api so i'm wondering where in the process uh does the data that, that you supply or the user supplies through you through self-sovereign identity, where does that actually then meet that uh, entity resolution process step? Is it at the customer or do you have a use an entity resolution uh, uh, provider? We always show who is the issuer of the verifiable credential container set. So if it has been done by a telecommunication provider, you as a verifier will fully understand what kind of checks has have been done or not been done. Also, if you use the IMX video ident, also there we comment on what background checks have been made in order to onboard this person or this entity. And we also provide a timestamp. And based on this, you as a verifier can decide whether you accept this credential container set or not. But we always give it to you as a simple thing that you can use. 
I see. So it's like delegated uh, auth auth authentication or verification, credential verification. If somebody else did went through this process, which can be quite expensive, then that that uh, that expense can then be uh, conser conserved by the next party because the yes. next party will will. Uh, but what is the benefit for the person who actually digs into their wallet and spends the money to to do the entity resolution? Why why would that person want to share? I mean, they went through the expense and trouble of verifying. Why would they then? Uh, why would they then be willing to allow uh, somebody else to use that, even if uh, a lot, even if the next person? Uh, was allowed to use that uh, was under some kind of the regulatory framework which allowed them to use it. Why would the person who actually incurred the expense be willing to share it? Yes, very good question. Um, number one, uh, besides our technology, there is no solution that makes this possible in a GDPR conform way. And I can comment on whether this is true or not later, but let's just work with this hypothesis, but this um, was a key differentiator. Um, regarding why would they do it, we have to look out of the glasses of a telecommunication company in Europe. Um, if you look at the profit and loss statement, the average net result contribution per customer per year amounts to six euros or six US dollars. So when you have 10 million customers times six euros, this is your profit. Not more than six euros per customer per year. And our technology in a conservative case adds a additional revenue stream with a net result contribution of at least three euros per customer per year. And this is based on a conservative calculation that a certain of certain amount of customers just buys Netflix. I'm using this example because the sales commission there is so low. So the probability of an ongoing new revenue stream that we drive back to the telecommunication partner and they are resulting in a significant net result contribution is a high motivation. Mm, I understand. Okay, thanks a lot. Appreciate your answering my question. There's some great questions, Adifan. Thank you. Um, I do have a quick follow up before we move on to Liprog. Sorry, mate, for cutting you off. Um, they've just DM me. They said, "Is selling the uh, twelve times only for the first tranche of investors, or for everyone?" Regarding the tokenomics. Right now, if you purchase the token in our private sale or if you invest in our pool, what you receive there are IMX token generation one. Only generation one token have this built-in benefit that you get this forever capitalistic reward to the first purchaser. Um, who does not get this? Our business model is based on, like I said, it is 100% free for the user, for you and me. So it's a B2B model. So the verifiers that buy the credentials usually do not get IMX generation one because this is reserved for the two sources, private sales and pool, where we get the IMX token as a reward for staking ADA. So the probability of the, of the transaction is that a verifier will buy the token. And this is very important for you as a purchaser because only then we will see a verification and only then this will result in one additional IMX token for you as the first purchaser because it was used. And therefore we have also built the complete supply and demand mechanism that it's a pure B2B demand business case. So the probability that when you sell, it will, with a high probability, lead to usage. And why is this important? Because this is, you know, 
the metric based on Fibonacci. Only usage triggers growth. Awesome. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, we're going to go over to LeProg and then to lead time null afterwards. Thanks. Um, my question here is about the ability, or I guess it's more about the merchant interaction or merchant and affiliate interaction, not so much as the consumer side. And I'm trying to understand if you can set up more complex arrangements uh, besides basic verification or the sharing of direct information. And I wanted to put it into context of a specific business case uh, I'm hoping to solve at some point uh, where I want to have the ability to verify that a product was sold through a specific affiliate, uh, or I guess in this case, it's a retailer. And we sell through the retailer, and then they confirm the purchase of the product, and upon confirm, uh, confirmation, we cut them a rebate or a check. So in that arrangement, though, we wanted to set up a system, especially in Europe, where the sellers or I'm sorry, the retailers are completely anonymous. So there would be a pool of money that can be drawn against that we would have an automated verification system that helped to you know, basically validate that the products were sold, but still keep the retailers themselves anonymous. And I'm trying to figure out if this kind of technology could support a model like that. So we could basically have a more advanced promotional methodology that we could utilize through affiliates and retailers. Yes, um, also there, our little Minecraft building blocks just makes this possible that we put what you have just said into a simple smart contract. And in order that a smart contract works, we need reliable identity, but we do not, do not need to disclose this. We just need to ensure that money successfully goes from, from A to B. And also there, our technology works exactly what was your wish in your described business model to enable those so-called asynchronous workflows that directly compensate or let's say reward the person who has initiated the transaction. So yes, it is fully supported and it can be put into a simple smart contract so that it's completely decentral and works independent of your C-level decisions, for example. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Awesome. Right. Lead time. You're up. Hey, guys. Um, yeah, thanks for letting me uh, spill my two love laces here. And uh, thanks for hosting the show here, Dumpling Weed and Stoic. Uh, to start with, uh, I want to I do a read back here, Tim, to... to so help me understand if I completely go off the rails and have misunderstood something. So it sounds like your identity system is a pseudonymic token system and the user in your system holds a token as their uh, identity. So the primary revenue stream in this business model is affiliate fees earned from connecting businesses and consumers. So the consumers are your users who pay using your system and affiliate revenue is earned when the user consumes from a business partnered with you. Uh, you share this affiliate revenue with your token holders, uh, enabling people to earn basically an amalgamated cashback reward from the entire user base consumption with affiliate partners. Uh, have I misunderstood something? I think... Um at least at a second glance, it is also significant to mention the revenues from the ongoing token transactions as a relevant revenue stream. Also, if you only calculate maybe 20 cents for this or whatever, but it is a, it is a significant revenue stream, just to complete your view on the <laughs> revenue stream model. Okay, okay. All right, so the token holders also share in uh, effectively royalties of the sales of the uh, identity tokens. All right, um, so in, in, in that case, so there, there's some things that I that doesn't make sure. Oh, uh, Indigo, your uh, mic on. James, mute your mic or I have to mute you. Oh, my. 
<laughs> All right. Um, so here's what I don't get. Um, it it only like the tokenized sales system you're talking about. It only makes sense to me um, if you want to create a scarcity in order to pump the price of the token, probably for like seed funding, which might be a legitimate case, but. The more expensive the token is, the higher the barrier to entry is on your network for your users, which will mean you will have fewer users, which will mean that you will have less value for the affiliate businesses, which means you will have less revenue than you could have, which will reduce the value for the users, which is going to reduce the price of your token, right? So the more users you have in the system you're designing, the more valuable the network becomes for the users, the businesses, and therefore the tokens. So why wouldn't you want to give your tokens away for free? If your system works as designed, you should arguably pay people to onboard and start using it because that would be more profitable for you and the users. And if it's only for raising seed funds, then why, why ruin what sounds like a great idea for a payback, uh, cashback reward system by mixing in your seed funding mechanism into the perpetual motion of, of how the MO is supposed to go going forward. There's a lot to unpack, um, but uh, I'm, I'm sure I probably misunderstood some things. So I hope you can correct me. Well, at least none of the things that you might have in your back mind that we have built into the IMX token model for whatever motivation, even if it should have been, is completely irrelevant because it is basically only working on those Fibonacci metric uh, sequence. So there is no hidden agenda in order to, like you said, raise money early to a certain price. So this has never been a motivation. So we have a very, very clear structure and the future development is purely based on the usage of uh, the token. And um, out of the eyes of the verifier, those are transaction costs. And it is important that transaction costs uh, do not fluctuate strongly. And if you would also there use regular methods of issuance of token regarding a certain amount of token to a certain amount of time, it would have a negative effect on the transaction cost regarding the IMX token. And therefore there, it is also important that it is connected regarding how many tokens are issued based on the usage, because we need to ensure in our model, and there you are right, that it becomes a de facto standard by usage. And this only works if we drive mass market adoption and therefore the price may not explode and therefore this functionality is built in the token in the dna without the influence that we have on this i hope this was understandable uh, it helped a bit but it raised a few more questions I'll, I'll try to fire them off quick so i can open the floor to the other uh, people with some questions here so i i'm i'm afraid i'm sorry because i'm not probably just being a slow cop right now i don't understand w like what the fuck fibonacci has to really do with anything i understand fibonacci and it's a means to an end but insofar as why do you have to charge money for a token that you would arguably make more money and therefore your users would make more money if you made it as easy as possible in other words free to use if the system works as you're designing it, then yes, why would more free. tokens have a negative effect on transaction cost? But we are free. No? This is what I said. We are 100% ah. free for the user because user is users are our capital. Out of users, we generate revenue streams for us, for you as the users, and also for the for the onboarding partners. So okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I thought that you were, charging for, uh, you were charging oh. for minting the tokens. You're not doing that. You're giving them away for free at Mint. For, yes, for the new customers. And only the verification, this is the business case, is usually paid by the verifier. 
if he wants to use our system with all the benefits regarding one click fulfillment so that the form is filled and that the neuer customer process is reusable okay all right i think that's really good i still don't understand why you would want to limit uh, the amount of tokens you would, you would have out then because there needs to be some boundary regarding the amount of token and um, um, why why because if you would do a um, value calculation on regarding what is the fair price the fair value of an of an imx token you have to calculate the world economy regarding the amount of people that are living regarding the amount of people who are using the internet to purchase goods and stuff and based on this metric if you have a certain cap the value is of course different for an imx token if you have no cap at all and um, we have decided for a size that is pretty big but it only will happen if it's if we really see mass market adoption and therefore it is completely implied into the development mechanism of the IMX token. Okay, thank you. That that help, helps very much. I'll leave with my last comment of understanding here. Then I, I promise I'll, I'll step down, uh, Dumbling. Um, all right, so what it sounds like, what I would urge you to reconsider in this is that it sounds like you've effectively merged together the functionality of a dividend stock with the entrance access permission for your users so in other words your users can't use and identify with your product if they don't own what is practically equivalent to a dividend stock so you're limiting the amount of people that can actually participate in this thing uh, by the sound of it i would urge you to reconsider that unless i've misunderstood that woefully I think we are not limiting. I mean, we are open doors to every user in the world to ensure a 100% free onboarding. And even if technical transaction fees are missing, it is provided. So we are very user friendly. We are really 100% free for the user. We really make it possible that all the users can onboard without any um, technology hurdles. I don't know when whether this was your question. No, no, sorry. It was in relation to your tokenomics. If you need a token to verify your identity and you have a capped amount of tokens, you have a capped amount of users. Yes, but in the end, um, the maximum amount that could live forever regarding the IMX token is 13.75 billion. So this is a pretty high number. If you look at, for example, there are 4.8 billion smartphone users in the world. So the amount of token that we would have into a complete circulating supply is that it can be used three times by each smartphone user, but it's a rollover process. So I think it is big enough to ensure a identity, a token-based identity system regarding this amount and regarding the amount of possible world users for this. And because we can never predict the amount of users, therefore we build it into the Fibonacci sequence. Okay, I think I talked about Fibonacci enough right now. All right, I, I could keep going here, but I don't want to take up any more of the time. Uh, so uh, thanks for letting me speak, guys. And uh, thanks for uh, answering the questions, Tim. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you, Lee Time. There were some, uh, to be honest, I, uh, I struggled with some parts of the concept myself. So it was really nice that you came up and asked the questions instead of me. <laughs> uh, we're going to go over to Weeple. You got your hand up, mate. You're up next. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question about uh, the biometric identity gateway terminals. Um, uh, it sounds like you guys are building, I'm imagining almost like a, a security checkpoint when you walk into a airport. Um, 
is that accurate or, or what can you share about these uh, gateway terminals? Um, one of the principles of self-sovereign identity, and we are always coming back to this because this is a principle, is that um, there may not be any obstacles. So if you want to onboard your phishing diploma on the chain, then you as a customer should not wait until the phishing diploma state agency issues this phishing license as a verifiable credential container set on the ledger of your choice. So this is the idea behind this hardware software thing. And therefore we have developed a terminal. Um, the key function is to make revenue. So it's three meters high. It weighs 264 kilos. Um, it has a 70 inch Ilyama um, display with 700 nits, so it's very, very visible. And it has a second screen where you can directly purchase products and where you can also onboard certain proofs that you have in your physical life, usually in your wallet regarding your plastic cards or certain papers like your diploma. And for this, our hardware and software biometric identity gateway has a scanner and a biometric camera that is used in Europe for border crossing. So we use this technology to onboard credentials from the physical world and to put them on the chain of your choice. And by the process that we are doing, we have chosen the highest possible level that there is out there in developed markets. And therefore, we have chosen the technology that has um, certain approvals, for example, from the BSE in Germany regarding the process of onboarding biometrics. And it is also approved by the FBI Appendix F regarding rolled fingerprints. So this is a technology we did not develop this technology. We are just using this technology in order to onboard real world credentials um, on the chain. And it has a live detection also for your fingers, so you cannot steal any identity. And we can connect the biometrics that you have to all of your wallets with the benefits, with the big benefits that you do not need to remember any more passwords because you are connected via your biometrics and you cannot lose your biometrics. You do not lose your face, your iris, your fingerprints, your voice, the way how you do a signature regarding the strength and the speed that you, that you put on the electronic ball pen. So this can be captured and this can be used in various forms. The biggest benefit is that it gives you as the customer super admin C rights to always reaccess your identity no matter what happens. And where where do you imagine uh, these terminals being located, um, maybe at least initially for the project? I think we will have two groups. Number one is the developed markets because they need to generate revenues. But the biggest impact is in countries in the world where you have people facing a lack of national identity. So the total amount worldwide amounts to 1.4 billion people. So it's a significant amount. It's mostly happens in countries in Africa and in certain countries in Asia. And this technology there is a substitute for a national identity, making it possible to solve local problems of local people, for example, get their first bank account get their first exchange account, get their first mobile phone contract because they had no proof of identity before. And so this is groundbreaking there to provide identity. And the second one is the other developed markets where you can just, you know, interact with the customer with all the benefits of normal passwords. But I think the, the biggest benefit in doing good um, are the countries in Africa and in Asia where it really 
makes a difference to provide identity there because it is the first step in order to participate in the monopoly game, you know, without identity, no ownership. Therefore, it is a key element there, a ground working thing that we need to do. Thank you. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, have you ever seen the film called The Minority Report with uh, Tom Cruise, where people get like, if you want to change your identity, you got to get like an eyeball transplant because yes, everything just scans your eye? Yeah, super cool movie. Yeah, yeah I've seen great it. film. Cool. Thank you for answering my question. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I, I have a couple of questions for literally a five-year-old. So sorry about that, Tim. But before we do that, I'm going to give Indigo James. Did you have a question or are you just up here loitering? Like, would you like to ask a question? This is the opportunity. No, I'm just loitering. Sorry. All right. Cool. I, I no, think no, other no. people, yeah, I You're think fine. they covered some of the stuff I was, I was thinking. So. It's all right to loiter. You're not in trouble, mate. Um, so, okay, Tim. So please be patient with me. I love the idea of self-sovereign identity. I think it's fantastic. But what, I, I've got a couple of things that I'm not quite 100% sure on your solution. So you said that it can go on a bunch of different uh, blockchains. And on your uh, the website's un under redevelopment at the minute, but on your like slide deck, it says 43 ledgers. Yeah. So how does that work? How, it, like, if I pick a particular ledger, like Cardano, say, because you said you were building on Cardano initially, so I just wanted to check. Um, if I put my ID on Cardano, is that right, how that works? Uh, could I then put it on Ethereum? Or if I put it on a different one, what happens if that one pulls a lunar on us and kind of goes tits up? Would, would it mean I, how would I then recover my identity? Would it get minted onto a different blockchain? Pretty cool questions. I'm very impressed. So how do we do this? Um, we have a partner that should be in the space today, but I think because of certain technical reason, reasons, maybe he did not, he did not, he did not make it. So um, if you look at the topic self-sovereign identity, um, Marco Sabadello, who is not here right now, is one of the greatest authors. He is um, also a member of the World Wide Web Consortium, just, you know, covering this topic of um, decentralized identifiers, so-called DITs. And those are the ones where you asked, what does it mean? Are they being saved on 43 different ledgers? So we use the technology of the company of Marcos. The name of the company is The New Tech. And the technology behind is it's a resolving technology. So it's like resolving websites. So for example, right now, there are 14.4 billion website resolutions per day. And um, the probability that this amount also comes to a very high level regarding so-called DITs is probable based on our business model. And in order to make this interoperable work on any ledger, we use the technology of the Nube Tech to resolve, to translate, to connect to 43 different ledgers and to write, I think right now he has connected eight. But yes, you can save your yes. identity on Ethereum, but you need to pay the transaction fee. So we have no stake in this. So we have no profit, no loss. It is just, you know, transaction fees. We do not care, but we make this possible because we are multi-chain, but we are ledger agnostic. So you decide where you want to save your identity. The question, the next question was, what happens if if the ledger blows up, right? Yeah, that's right. So I think usually it it would not blow up. You know, if the ledger is not there anymore, um, I think we have to answer the question whether this is whether this is uh, possible um, or not. You can always issue new credentials. So um, the model that we have is not based on deleting certain amounts in those credential container sets, but um, to save those credentials into in, uh, into a certain logic that it works with, with, with various business models. And um, therefore it can easily be updated. The telco has a motivation to update it. 
you can use the terminal, you can use the um, X video ident process to update data. So also there, open doors, it is always possible to update credentials so they can be used in transactions. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Uh, the other thing I was wondering was you you have like a finite amount of tokens and each each token is each token representing an identity or if I misunderstood that. 80%. Okay. Yeah, so if uh like if I had like if I've got one token that's my identity. Uh, well, tokenized identity, obviously. Um, and then if I use that, I send, would essentially have to send it to someone for verification, like to the verifier, or I'd send it to the vendor or the merchant, and then it would go to the verifier for authentication. Or okay. Like, how does that process work? You are connected with your token to the IMX marketplace, well, we have a natural demand of IMX token. And we do not compete with purchasers. So we connect you and the verifier with the opportunity to purchase token. And this is based on our B2B marketplace that connects like a regular marketplace buyer and seller. And there they have the demand for the verification and in order to do a verification, you need a token. And where do you buy it? On the marketplace. Yeah, okay. So that bit kind of goes over my head a little bit, Tim. But I appreciate you being patient with me. All right? I'm not trying to be like awkward or anything. It's just so because these are obviously very difficult things to conceptualize. And I'm trying to visualize the process in my, my head because I couldn't find anything like on the uh, on, on the slide deck that kind of draws it draws a map for me basically because that's how I like to see things. Um, okay, so it's just quite complicated for me to uh, to kind of visualize. That's all. Um, and and the other thing, oh, I've completely forgotten what it was now. You might have to give me a second, but uh, there was another question. Oh yeah, um, this is like a this is this might seem really stupid, all right? So I appreciate you being patient for me. But if I go on to buy something now, my details are automatically filled into a form. So where like other than my like, actual physical identity, like for uh, like um, access permissions, for example, uh, or like proof of age or something like that, well, like where does that come into like the purchasing stuff online? Because like all my details are already kind of stored in various databases, and they're automatically just put in whenever I kind of I start typing my email address, and it just pops up with all my. It's automatically populated. You know what I mean? I think you should take the time, for example, in the next three days to always take a note when independent of that you said that you are connected to your frequently used e-commerce partner sites in order to purchase something there or that you have a browser plug-in that helps you to, to fill in forms. I would kindly ask you, you know, to, to take those notes because this is important to understand our model. Our technology really makes it possible that you treat the entire internet like you are locked in. So it is much more convenience oriented. It is integrated in the IMX identity wallet, what is an app on your iPhone or on your Android, and it is connected in to your browser plugin. And there you have a button, it's called IMX one click fulfillment, then you fill in the form completely. You see via a mouse over what kind of attributes are exchanged. And if there should be a know your customer process needed, and this is what you have with every exchange where you open an account with every bank account, with some kind of insurance policies that you do, with some kind of utilities that you do, with mobile phone contracts, with, with broadband. So with all the stuff in the internet where the sales commission is really, really high. There, our technology can be used in order to substitute the next my customer process because it is reusable. And this is where the benefit is so relevant for the verifier. 
Okay, yeah. Sorry, I do. I appreciate you just explaining it to me like a child, because uh, it like I, I understand conceptually what things can be used for, but actually the process of it sometimes just goes straight over my head. Um, so the the last thing, if I have um, the my wallet connected because the web free service, I'm assuming that would be how it works when it's fully realized. I connect my wallet to a thing, and then it's automatically done. Um, how how do I share that identity with my token if it's bought off you, like from your B2B marketplace, like how do I actually own that for myself? I did not understand the question, I'm sorry. So if if I'm trying to buy something online, just as the going example, connect my wallet to some DAP, buy a thing on Amazon or whatever, or not Amazon, but you know, whatever it is, um, how, how do I own my identity if the vendor or the verifier or vendor is buying the token off you if the exchange is between you and them like how where where's the self sovereign part of it um the payment only takes place if you have as a customer have said yes before and this only happens if you have initiated the transaction or if you are willingly paying a certain subscription so it is always something that has been initiated by you, by the customer. And only in this case, we find a use case for the IMX token for the, for the verification. So it never happens without asking you. It's always based on that you really initiate this and it is fully transparent what kind of attributes are exchanged and for what reason? And this does not include payment. So when you have certain security settings for payment that you need a two-factor authentication, then we do not replace this. We are not a substitute for payment. We are just the identity brick, but we make payment very, very easy and possible while we are not overruling your security settings. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I, I understand that part of it. But my question is more about the self-sovereign aspect of it, right? You say that I initiate it, but where do I actually own, like, where, what, where do I own the identity? You know, where, where is it self-sovereign? Because it sounds like from your solution, I might have just misunderstood, that actually you have it and you set that connection with the vendor or with the verifier, whoever, whoever that is, because it can be quite confusing dish, dist, uh, swapping, chopping and changing those terms or adding a third person or par party into the mix. Uh, so so where do I actually own the identity? Like, How is it self-sovereign? Because it, it sounds like maybe it's just how I've interpreted your explanation, but it sounds like the vendor deals with you rather than with me actually sharing that information. I, I just give permission for you to share it. And if that's the case, then surely it's no different to just having that stored on a local, uh, like my iPhone, for the sake of filling out a form, or on Brave or Chrome browser or however else that works. You know, it, it doesn't seem like it's much different. It's just you and the identity information rather than them. We do not have your data. Never. So it's a decentralized storage. It's never, never within IMX. It cannot be recovered by IMX. It cannot be accessed by IMX. We are just the service that this little identity Minecraft building block exists. And this Minecraft building block has 14 attributes. They are all important. Therefore, they will, I will all name them because they all answer your question. So they are customer owned, customer controlled, portable, decentral, they are conform in almost every country regarding GDPR and AML. They are interoperable, open, user-centric, accessible, secure, multilingual, privacy insured, technology neutral, simple to manage. So they work in every ecosystem. We do not have stakes in this. And you own those credentials. We have no access to them. We just connect the dots because we see this as a business model, like a marketplace. We just connect buyer and seller, but we do not look into their wallets. We just set up a marketplace so that buyer and seller can interact. 
We make it very, very easy for both sides with big, big benefits. But we never have access to the customer's data, never. So therefore, it is fully self-sovereign, especially because of the Fortune, ad Fortune attributes that I just mentioned. They completely, completely aligned with the demand of how a system like this should be structured so that's really fully self-sovereign and decentral. Perfect. Thank you for explaining that and just being a bit patient with me. I don't, I'm not trying to be rude or anything. I just really want to understand it. Um, so, yeah, I really appreciate that, Tim. I, I don't really have any other questions, to be honest. I mean, I, we could go over the same thing a couple of times, but I think I'm basically done. Thank you. Thank you, Riz, for the questions. And yeah, shout out to Tim. Really admire the way he has been handling the questions. I think some questions were really searching and it's not an easy topic to discuss, but it looks like Tim knows exactly what he was talking about and he was super patient. I'm going to end the space with one final question. Today we have been talking a lot about the tech, about the numbers, about the tokenomics. But I want to draw your attention towards the people. So I went through their team list, partnership list, advisor list. It looks like it's a very fantastic team. So Tim, do you want to take just a few minutes to quickly tell us about the team, your experience, and some of the very impressive advisors you have? And we already know one of them is Ada Well, but you have some more really interesting people on your team. Yes, um, we have Tim Bruckmann, who is like the coach. So he has selected every team member of IMX. This is one of his greatest capabilities to be a great team builder. So he also brought me into this uh, project. Um, he's responsible for marketing and he has a track, round, track record in the segment of about 20 years. Um, Dennis is our CTO also track record of 20 years in, I think, the leading e-commerce websites in Germany and parts of Europe. So a really, really hardcore full stack IT developer. Um, we had a founding colleague, Jochen Leinberger, um, who, have, who has developed with us um, the principles of um, the IMX verifiable credential model. This is um, something that is very demanding regarding the IT solution. So we are very happy to have him on board there. We have Andre Eilertsen, who is our crypto community manager and also responsible for the um, IMX tool, also with a track record of already several years, also in um, Cardano. Um, we have a CFO with 30 years of expertise in um, tax and accounting and bookkeeping and legal. So the big picture is, and yes, and we have a really cool um, new person in our marketing uh, department. Her name is um, Lisa Wessel. She has also done this very successful for Meld and other cryptos. So she's like a breath of fresh air and she has been responsible together with Tim Brückmann, for example, to reshape the complete IMX deck and also to reshape um, the website. And we have like 10 or 20 more partners. All of um, all have, you know, this joint background that they have a business expertise of at least about 20 years in, in Web2, in e-commerce projects, in various areas, especially where the IMX technology is, is operating in. So we are a very experienced team regarding our operational uh, track, rec track record and uh, strategic know-how. Thank you very much. Yes, so I have spoken with Eilertsen a few times in the past. I can't really name them, but I know IMX has a lot of very interesting, impressive partnerships in the pipeline. So definitely hoping to see more of your updates. Thank you very much, Tim, for coming here today and patiently explaining your concepts. I learned a lot about SIS and DID. I'm sure the listeners did too. 
People seem to have been listening very closely today. Must admit that some of the concepts are still confusing and deserves a bit more researching later. And it's not an easy thing to do. Revolutionizing self-sovereign identity. It's very challenging things you guys are doing. A lot of considerations are going into your project. So I hope IMX, with your fantastic team of industry experts and scholars, you're going to build something really revolutionary. And I think you have the community backing you guys. So tomorrow, we have another exciting project called New M, revolutionizing the music royalty sector. Really looking forward to that as well. White paper is out, so guys, go read it and join the space tomorrow. Look forward to seeing you. And Tim, thank you again. Hope you have a nice rest of the